pandemic trapped a bunch of aging role-playing gamers in their homes, forcing them to crawl out of their pen and paper comfort zone and into the online world of virtual tabletops and video calls. To join them as they raise the curtain to share their stories, insights, and love all things geek. Welcome to the Advanced Age Role-Playing Gamers Podcast. Assholes. Hello and welcome to the Advanced Age Role-Playing Gamers Podcast. Uh, I'm uh, your one of your co-hosts, Nathan, and I've also got with me... Matt, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, so I've got uh, uh, Thomas, uh, please say your last name for me. Uh, it's Heronstam. Heronstam, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. That's uh, a lot easier than I was expecting. So uh, <laughs> I think it's probably easier than my, my last name. Uh, but we got uh, Thomas Harris, Heronstam to talk about the uh, Blade Runner uh, RPG today. Uh, again, um, if you uh, haven't uh, watched this before, if you could uh, give us a, a, a like or leave a review on your favorite podcast or even uh, like and subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, it'd be a, a huge help and help us find uh, our audience. So, Thomas, uh, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. And maybe if you could uh, um, talk about uh, a bit about your role at Free League and maybe dive into how you started gaming. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of the founding members of, of Free League. We were four people starting out. Uh, we founded the company about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, actually. Um, and I now have the role of a CEO, even though it's fairly, you know, we, we make decisions fairly you know, together. We're a small business and, and do this as a passion, but now also as a business. So that's uh, the way it works. I started playing tabletop RPGs way back in the 80s. It was a big thing, I guess, everywhere, but also in Sweden, where I'm from back then. There was a bunch of Swedish RPGs coming out back then. They were, of course, uh, heavily inspired by the, the American games that, that came before. Uh, a guy who, who had been to the U.S., I think he did some work as an intern for Chaosium or something in the mm-hmm. early 80s. He came back to Stockholm and founded a, a game publisher and he started publishing RPGs in Swedish in Sweden, and that's kind of caught on here, and and uh, you know pretty much everybody played it, or at least uh, it was a big thing. And that I was right in that generation. I was I was born in the mid seventies. So I was a young teenager in the mid eighties, so that was kind of you know that that took me by storm, and, and it didn't quite ever go away. So it's, I've been with it ever since in one way or another. Even though certain periods of my life I've played less, and, and other periods more. So. Yeah, around 10, 15 years ago, I, I kind of, after I haven't been away from RPGs for a while, I kind of got back in and then also started doing some writing and freelancing and small stuff for fun. And that's where I also met the other three people who ended up fun, founding Free League. We were just a bunch of freelancers doing, you know, writing things for fun for other games. And, and uh, we took over a bigger project and that's when we decided to start the company, but it was still very small scale, still very much a hobby thing. It's something we did in our free time and weekends and, and, and so on. Uh, and the general grew from there and we decided to take a chance and publish a game in English after a couple of years. That was Mutant Year Zero was the first one we did in English and uh, that was fairly well received. So we did another one and then another one after that and that was Tales from the Loop, which caught on and won some awards and was kind of became a, a, a bit of a thing, uh, and it kind of grew from there. And then a couple of years later, this turned into a business that actually a few of us now uh, actually live off of. So that it turned in, the hobby turned into a bit of a, a day job, really. So that's, uh, that's kind of how it worked out. We never expected that to be the case when we started out. But it's, uh, it's been a fun ride. Matt always says it's, it's uh, making uh, making your hobby your day job. Uh, right. That's, that's the dream, right? <laughs> So that, yeah, yeah. So I I have to say that um, the reason we're here talking is um, you know started out kind of a as you know well it's a pretty negative thing to to start off with but it's because of the, the pandemic um, you know, we started our podcast you know as friends you know the the, the whole lot of us uh, who were playing a regular game but on top of that. Uh, Freely gave away uh, some games when the pandemic started, when people are start uh, locked in at home, uh, and I had been eyeing uh, Forbidden Lands at my local one of my local game stores uh, for a while. I flipped through, I was like, "This looks really cool. This is really gritty. I, I, I like this." But I hadn't really, I hadn't 
handed over my credit card yet. <laughs> so, uh, and he gave it away, and I, I downloaded it, read it, loved it, bought Alien, back to Twilight 2000, <laughs> and um, and here we are. So, <laughs> uh, so great. Yeah, Nathan really introduced the free league genre of games to our group. Uh, cool. It would primarily been, you know, traditional sort of either D and D or Pathfinder kind of, yeah. you know, play games. games. Yeah, right. Uh, so yeah, it was we'd never heard of the company. We're like, oh, this sounds interesting, and you know, mm-hmm. yeah. So so uh, serendipity. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's what we're going to call it. Uh, but I really appreciate the the work that you you folks do. And uh, so asking about that, you've been able to take this years. Year Zero engine that you created for Mutant Year Zero and apply it to other genres and, and different IP. And so what was your kind of whole philosophy in putting together the Year Zero engine? What, what was your inspiration for that? Yeah, I mean, a bunch of things. Uh, it was never intended to be a, 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 like a rules engine used in multiple games. That was never the plan starting out. It was basically a system that we tinkered with over, I mean, over 10 years ago when we started working on the game that then turned out to be Mutant Year Zero, when, when we started doing work on the game design, it didn't even have a name. So it was just, a, you know, this post-apocalyptic thing that we're doing for fun. I mean, and that's where this, we started building this engine. And it's, it is it is influenced by a bunch of different things. I mean, games back in, I was really deep into the kind of indie movement, the Forge movement, a bunch of games that came out in the early uh, 2000s, mm-hmm. very cool games. Uh, too many to mention, but it was a cool scene of all really like indie games. And uh, some of that went into this, uh, some other things too. I wanted to, we, we wanted a game system that felt fast, accessible, that kind of supported the theme and feel of the game we were doing without getting in the way of the story. So that was kind of, we want rules, we like rules, but they should not sort of interfere. They should support the story, not sort of slow down the story. So that was always the, the goal. I think that has remained that way uh, in the other games uh, as well. So I guess that's a bit of a core philosophy. But we never intended it to be used for any other game than Mutant Year Zero. That was just why we designed it. But then when we did our second game in in English, uh, uh, after that was Coriolis, a new edition of a, of a game, a Swedish game, old Swedish game called Coriolis. And we did a second edition that was released in 2017. And we had tried. We never intended to use the Year Zero engine for that. So we tried a bunch of different systems. We tried out using Fate. We tried mm-hmm. out using all, uh, other homebrew and completely different systems. And then we just said nothing really worked. So then we just said, well, maybe just try the same system that we used in Mutant Year Zero. Just see if that works. I mean, we just got fed up with trying different things, <laughs> and it didn't really work. And we and it kind of worked. And we of course then we decided we need to change something. So it's it's quite different to Coriolis. It it uh, has some common things with Mutant Year Zero, but it's also different. It focuses on on things like because religion and mysticism is a big thing in Coriolis. So we brought that into the game system, and it kind of worked. We felt so. Then when we did the game after that was Tales from the Loop. Uh, that was actually written by a freelancer, Nils Hinze. So it's sort of an uh, not by our own making. Fully, but then we felt that it would be kind of cool to use the Year Zero engine for this as well. So then Nils went to town on that and he did his own take on the Year Zero engine. Mm-hmm. So it, it uses the same core, but it's quite different, the version in Tales from the Loop. So, And by now we started feeling well, this is sort of, sort of turning out, turning into a, a house rule system more or less. And uh, then we did Forbidden Lands after that. Mm-hmm. And then I think we had the idea during the Kickstarter to actually make a like a, a open game license because we had some interest in the game system and we figured why not you know provide some resources for for other people to create games if they want to use what we have put together uh, in their own games that'd be cool so we decided so we made this open game license and and then it sort of ter- took off from that that and it became its own its own thing really yeah, I was just going to say, we've played several of the systems now, and I've read some of the others. Like, I picked up Coriolis um, last year and read it. It's, it's awesome. And I, I like the idea that the core rule system is fairly easy to pick up. Once once you've got it, you kind of understand sort of the sort of the skill and the stat mechanics, and that's sort of the core of your character. Um, it's been easy for our players to pick up and move from game system to game system. But I really like the nuances, right? I, I like that in um coriolis right you've got like those darkness points right yeah. and that, that's a that's an interesting mechanic that lends itself to the feel of that game right or 
or in um, I was kind of joking with Nathan. We really liked aliens and my comment on aliens. Now, I suppose if you ran a really long campaign, your characters would improve and spend experience points. But it, for us, I thought it was interesting that in a lot of like traditional D and D, like your character gets more powerful, better, stronger with aliens. Our characters were the best they were going to be the minute <laughs> we started. And it was all downhill from there. And we yeah. all loved the stress mm, mechanic oh from aliens. God. Like, yeah. because it's, often when we played for a very long time, you find that it's really hard to shock your players, right? It's like, Oh, the zombie bursts out of the floor. And you're like, okay, it's 800 zombie I've ever seen. Right. Having the stress mechanic, put a mechanic in that both kind of, I think it's helpful for the GM, but I think it's also for the help for the players to give them that role playing nudge, right. To be in these awful scenarios and their characters are kind of losing their mind. So I, I, it's been a really good mechanic for us. We've enjoyed um, sort of its adaptability across the different systems. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that is exactly what we you know, intended to do and what we set out to do is to, to add these mechanics that kind of reinforce the specific style and stories of the game in question and, uh, and kind of enhance the story. So I think, uh, you know, hopefully, and, and that's, that's kind of the way it works in, in the alien game as well, that these stress dice, they become something fairly tangible and, and, and concrete for players to, to relate to. And that can inform the role playing, which so that the game system really kind of enhances the role playing instead of blocking it. So that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the way we approach uh, pretty much every game that we do. So we might as well start talking about Blade Runner now <laughs> on, mm-hmm. on, on that note. So what, what have you taken from previous versions of the Year Zero engine and implemented in Blade Runner? Yeah, we, we had a long discussion about that. Uh, I think one thing we wanted to try out uh, for was, a, I, I was sort of thinking about a system that did not use uh, dice pools of D6s, but that worked a bit differently. And the reason is that we wanted a version of the user engine with less dice, pretty much, for a variety of different reasons. We wanted it for Twilight 2000 because there you would add ammo dice, which would be adding that to the fairly large dice pools uh, you had already would be completely unmanageable. So we felt we needed something different there. And also we were in parallel really working on Blade Runner because those two games were started out Mm. pretty much at the same time. Now, so that they've been, it's not one after the other. It's more like they were developed side by side. So in Blade Runner, we felt that we wanted to focus a lot on the investigations, on the casework and handouts and solving that cases. So you had lots of maps and handouts and documents and photos and things. You'll have a pretty full table anyway. So we'd, we didn't want to have, add like huge fistfuls of dice on top of that. We just felt that would be distracting. Yeah, so it, it also you have the character development in Blade Runner that you will be focusing quite a bit on the ca- individual characters. And we felt that with all that going on, having a fairly busy uh, table with lots of dice would kind of distract a little bit. So we want, wanted something slimmer, something, a robust system, but fairly uh, rules light that kind of folds, uh, supports the story, but goes a little bit into the background. So it's fairly scaled down, fairly slim system for Blade Runner. And that's why we want to try out this version that uses typically only two dice instead of rolling large dice pools. And uh, yeah, uh, it's, I think it's uh, doing what we set out for it to do, but it's going to be interesting to see how, how uh, you know, all of the backers react to it once we manage to get the full PDF and everything uh, into their hands. And that's, uh, it's an exciting time to see how, how people will respond to it. Yeah, that's coming soon. I'll, I'll be sure to you know post my feedback everywhere. So. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so that's what you've taken from pre- previous. Or what are what are some of the new elements you've added uh, to make this the, the investigative story that you're you're going for? Yeah, I mean, I think the most obvious thing is that thing that that we uh, it, it's two dice instead of of, of uh, a number of a pool of d sixes. Uh, we're also doing. Uh, doing actually critical hits a bit differently this time. Uh, that works a bit. Each each uh, game, each sort of weapon has a crit die that you roll. That mm. so that works a bit differently than in other games. Um, also, there is a stress mechanic that is has some similarity to 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 Alien, I suppose, but it's not as dramatic. You, you won't have people going into full panic quite <laughs> as much because that would be 
it doesn't quite fit Blade Runner. You're more of that. It's a slower burn. It's not as 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 intense. It's more of a yeah. So it has a different feel to it, and that has to be reflected in the rules. Uh, something we have added a fairly large subsystem that is not in any other Year Zero game is chase rules, both for foot oh, okay. chases, car chases, and even aerial chases with uh, these uh, cool spinner vehicles. So. To have uh, we have chase maneuvers and chase obstacles. It's so using cards uh, or, or random rolls on the table. You can kind of generate an obstacle course that sort of have to navigate when you run a chase, and that's kind of fun. So that's mm. uh, a new subsystem that we've uh, implemented uh, into the engine. That's pretty cool, Matt. You had some questions, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess, uh, and so I guess some minor more game mechanics like. Um, so, like, what kind of characters, or like, I don't know if there are, you know, something called arch types or whatever. What yeah. kind of characters can people play in uh, Blade Runner? Yeah, we decided pretty early on that we wanted to focus the game to give it a clear focus. Characters will be Blade Runners, and we decide that is limiting it in a way. But we felt that doing that allows us to focus on investigations and case work to give that's the structure of the game, really, of of, of these case files that that will be publishing for it. So you'll be presented with cases and the focus is casework. And for that to kind of make sense, you need the players to be Blade Runners. Otherwise, it would be a very strange, if you have one guy who's a Blade Runner and someone else who's something completely different, it would be a very weird group to to get to, to, to do. I mean, it would just not really make sense as a group. So that's why we decided to focus it on Blade Runners. And we felt there was so much within that space to do. There are Blade Runners of they don't all have to look like Deckard or Kay in the films. There can be a large variety of Blade Runners. And that's where these archetypes come in. So we have someone called the analyst, which is a bit of a crime scene investigator person. There's a fixer who's more of a social climber. There's the city speaker who's really good, you know, knows his way around the street, kind of like Gaff in the first film. There's an enforcer who's more of a special forces person and uh Yes, a bunch of different varieties and of, of Blade Runners, really, and that kind of widen the scope of what a Blade Runner can be. So those are some of the archetypes that are in the game. Cool. So you've got all these different archetypes. Do you have like a any suggestions for how people would form? How why would they be together? They're not going to meet meet in, a, in an inn, and you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so basically you will be, since every that that is a, the basis of the game is that all of the players will be Blade Runners and they will be given cases basically to, to investigate. Okay. So you have a very clear and logical and, and easy way into every every scenario, every case file, because basically you'll be on the job. So that, that kind of take care, takes care of that problem. Okay. What, we, what we do, though, is that since Blade Runner in the films, it's, it's really a noir uh, future noir, neo-noir, and, and it has a, it, in, in, in the films and also in the noir genre as a whole, you have these lone protagonists. Where it's very much focused on the individual, and that doesn't quite work in a natural way with, in role-play games, you usually have a fairly, you know, large group of people who run around yeah. doing things. So that's something we worked on, to ha- how to structure the casework in the investigations and allow players to split up from time to time and do stuff, go different places, to have short individual scenes both during the investigations and also more personal scenes where you can play like in your in your downtime you have downtime events and scenes to kind of give a, a feel that's something we worked on to kind of to get some of that sense of the individual characters that we feel is important for a game like uh, Blade Runner Go ahead, Matt. I know you are. Oh, no, yeah. no that's, that's what I was going to ask about. Um, well, I guess two, I'll ask the, the one question. So can um, can you play a replicant? I, so I saw something on the Kickstarter about stress and how it affects either a human or a replicant different, but I wasn't yeah. sure if you were all playing Blade Runners, was there an opportunity? Or, and if you do play a replicant, are you hiding that? Or, or are there open replicants that, I mean, because there's replicants in the world that aren't, hunted they're, yeah. they're just open so i guess if you could explain or, or talk about that a little bit because sure, i think sure. people would be interested yeah yeah absolutely um yeah one we set our game in the year 2037 and and the reason for that is that in the lore that's presented really in the 2049 film and the short films that were released shortly before they kind of show what happened in the years between the two films and then 
2036, uh, replicants were reintroduced after having been banned. Uh, they were reintroduced, allowed again on, on Earth, uh, and they were reintroduced by this Wallace Corporation, which is really the big corporation in the 2049 film. So you can see that in one of the short films, how, how uh, Neander Wallace, who's the CEO of this huge corporation, he, he showed, demonstrates his new, new uh, version, new generation of, of, of replicants. And basically, they are allowed, approved, and they're and they're introduced into society, and they're also uh, even into the lines of of being Blade Runners themselves. And that's what you see in the twenty forty nine film that this uh, main character K he is a replicant and a Blade Runner. So he basically hunts or investigates the older uh, generations of, of replicants that are on the, still on the run, and but he's sort of. Uh, loyal in a sense, it, at least at the beginning of the film. No spoilers, but anyway. So, yeah, uh, expo- if you haven't yeah. seen the movie already, stop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically, you have that same choice in the game that you can play. You will be a Blade Runner, but you can be a human Blade Runner or a replicant Blade Runner, like K. You can have that choice. Uh, that's and and they they are in some ways a little bit different in terms of the mechanics. Uh, like in the stress mechanics, they work a bit differently. Replicants can take, they're usually stronger and take more damage and things like that, but they're a bit more susceptible to stress in some ways. So they have hmm. Some different uh, differences there. Uh, also, there is an option, a completely uh, voluntary option for a player who plays a human uh, Blade Runner to actually be a hidden or a secret replicant. Basically, what they do is that if the player wants to, this is not mandatory, it's a, it's right. a choice, they can roll a die or have the GM roll a die, and if it comes up in a certain way, that character is actually a replicant without knowing it. And that can then be used in, in, in scenarios and in the game in, hmm. in different ways, and that can be a lot of fun. But we m- left it as an option, not, not as something that has to be the case, because some players really enjoy having those kinds of surprises sprung upon them, whereas other players... <laughs> hate that thing so they really <laughs> don't want to be surprised by oh by the way your character is not who you thought they were you know some 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 players hate that some others think it's a lot of fun so we left it as a as a something you can do if you want but it's not you won't be forced uh, to do that yeah i i I've found that that's true i love surprising the players and stuff like that but uh but you know we've been terrorizing but in a fun way. Um, but yeah, so, but there are some players where, where, uh, you know, I've made the mistake of, of taking some, giving the, a player some secrets that they didn't necessarily want. And, 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 you know, so uh, I feel bad, but, um, yeah, so that's, that's good. That's so, uh, we talked a little bit about the lore in the, in the movies. Did you pull any lore from, from any of the, the graphic novels, comics, any of that? Yeah, and that's that was really interesting. When I was I was aware of some of that, but, but before, but designing this game and working on this game, and also of course we dove head into everything, everything Blade Runner really explored all of the stuff that's been going on, and it's not just the two films; it's it's the comics. Uh, there is the an, recent anime. There is there are uh, various video games, and and, uh, and that's really cool to see and how that kind of ties the universe, expands the universe and ties it together. So we really wanted to tie, use these sources and tie them together to create uh, like a cohesive uh, whole that makes sense. And, and if you, so that we don't contradict anything that is said anywhere else and, and, and contribute to creating this universe. So that's, that's really been a big part of, of designing the game. And that's, uh, that's, I should be completely, uh, that's, not mostly not my job, but I, I've done most of the rules bits and, and mm-hmm. the overall project uh, management and so on. But uh, we have a setting writer who's uh, his name is Joe Lefavi, and he's been doing most of the setting work. So that all the credit for that should go to him. Yeah, he was he the gentleman on the um, the Victory Condition Gaming stream. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he was on a stream that we did uh, with Doug uh, a while back. Yeah, he was right. very, very excited. I, I, I yeah. enjoyed that. <laughs> yes, whole, he is. Um, He's an energetic guy. Yeah. So so if you have guys, if you haven't watched that, you should go watch that after you watch this. So <laughs> <laughs> um, so so uh, tying into that, I, I noticed that Titan mm-hmm. Publishing is publishing some some new Blade Runner uh 
comics. And yeah. since you've already kind of collaborated with them on the alien side, is are you working on collaborating with them on the uh, Blade Runner side? Uh, yeah, we're in touch with them uh, a, a little bit. Uh, we're not working very super, you know, closely on on the details on their comic, but we we do talk. Yeah, and uh, so we'll definitely we'll probably continue to do that going forward also. Uh, because they made the comics that were set in 2019 and then another series that was set in 2029. So it's approaching, you know, our date. So, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 so definitely look at, we definitely had a close look at what they did. Some of the stuff that happens in the comic, no spoilers again, but that, of course, we included in, in the world description of, of the RPG and, and so on. So that if you read the comics, you'll find things in, in the RPG that, oh, yeah, that's, you know, I know that because that, you know, obviously happened. There are some big things happening in the comics. So that you probably see that in the rpg and the and, and also so that we really want them to tie together and work together yeah, beautiful so yeah we we talked to when we talked to andrew gaska uh, about the, um, his work on alien he we, he talked about the relationship a bit so i i kind of was poking around and i saw this oh yeah yeah i wonder if there's a, there's a there's a link there so that's that's pretty cool yeah, yeah. I, I like that whole collaboration from different mediums uh, aspect of it. It really creates a, a much larger world that that yeah. uh, GMs can pull from. Um, so I have one more question that I really wanted to ask. So in creating these case files, um, you know, uh, in your starter set, I'm sure you've got a lot of materials um, uh, planned to, to get the GM for uh, to. You know, pre-designed case files. Do you have uh, in the rules um, detailed description of, of how a GM who hasn't built an investigation, investigative type of story, uh, what they would need to build a good case file? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have some some pretty solid tools for that in the core rule book. Uh, I think some of them are even unlocked as stretch goals. But yeah, so basically, that what well, there is a big chapter for for the game master, and that kind of details how a case file is structured in this game, how it's how it works, the key components of it, how how to put it together, basically. And also has a generator we can roll up uh, at least the core of a case file. You can roll mm-hmm. up what kind of case is it. What's the what's the big twist? What what are the main characters? Which are the main locations? And you can uh, rolling that up, you'll at least get a, a skeleton of a case file, and then you'll you know obviously need to embellish it uh, a little bit and maybe you know make it tie it together and and work on the details. But at least that generator can really help you get the core and the, of, of a case file file going. And we felt that was important because. This game is some of our other games. They are very sandboxy, open world go, and they can always almost be played without any preparation. They're very, mm-hmm. you know, no low prep or even no prep games, uh, and that's a lot of fun. This is a bit different though, because here you play investigations, so there kind of needs to be something to investigate. So they're a little bit. This game is a little bit less improvisational and needs a bit of a preparedness uh, before playing. So. And of course, we'll be developing and publishing finished official case files, but mm. we just know there's so much creativity out there among players, and I think it's just a lot of fun to design your own case files, and we felt that is something we want to uh, really encourage and contribute to. So we felt that it was really important for this game to have tools like that in the game. So that's uh, something we worked on, on on getting in there. So that's definitely a big part of the of the GM chapter in the core rule book. Okay. So um, I was checking out the uh, Kickstarter page, and uh, although I don't have the same addiction that Nathan has to <laughs> the problem that he has to Kickstarter. No, I, I did notice. So, I mean, clearly uh, uh, overachieved um, with with the expectations. And I just as a general sort of, um, I don't know, this is sort of a question or statement. So uh, you guys have been around for about 10 years and mm-hmm. in the short time that I've been exposed to your things, you've picked up things like The One Ring, right? Aliens, Blade yeah. Runner, Twilight 2000, which was a fairly iconic, you know, you've got Tales from a whole series of, of, of these IPs that you guys have grabbed up. Is this sort of been, did this just happen or was this the strategy? And if so, what are some 
What are some dream uh, IPs that you guys still haven't <laughs> gotten, but maybe you can actually talk about? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you can no, talk about I mean, them, it's, it's been fantastic to be able to work with uh, you know these amazing IPs that 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 we now work with. That has been you know a true true dream uh, come true. And uh, yeah, we we uh, it's not something we planned very early on, but we did start working with licenses. Even Mutant Mutant Year Zero is actually a licensed game mm. because Mutant was an old. That was one of the uh, that I mentioned very early on in in, in the interview. Uh, there was Mutant was one of the very first games in Sweden, so that's basically a new version of a Swedish game. Uh, and when we did that Year Zero Mutant Year Zero version, that was actually a licensed game from the uh, IP holder of that license so that we were early into licensing. That's something we started out doing very early. But of course, those early licenses were quite a bit smaller. But so, but we basically had at least, we knew how licensing worked. And I think that helped a lot. We got, got some solid experience in just working with licensed properties and that helped. And then we actually got in touch with the same Joe, Joe Lefavi, who now does the setting writing as well for the Blade Runner RPG. Mm. He also runs his his uh, his company, uh, Gen One Entertainment, and and, and uh, he he uh, has the right connections in in in, in the U.S. and Hollywood to, to approach and pitch uh, license uh, holders owners for for games, and that, that he's been in that field for a long time. And uh, we actually got together with him about four or five years ago, and that led to us uh, together pitching for both Alien and Blade Runner. So. Mm. That's just uh, been an amazing uh, journey to be on and, and having both of those games actually turning out to, to become a uh, reality. So, yeah, now we are in a place where, we, of course, uh, having you know, gotten the opportunity to work on these amazing, amazing franchises that, that are, you know, true. It's been, I don't know, it's completely, I wouldn't have believed it, you know, a decade ago that that would, or much less when I was, you know, playing games in the 80s. I thought, I, I, if I had known what would happen, I thought I would, you know, just believe it was going to be crazy. So <laughs> that has been that has been great. But, and right now, I'm, I'm honestly, I think uh, Alien and Blade Runner and The One Ring are such fantastic franchises that I don't walk around, uh, you know, longing for anything else. But yeah, we do have ideas for others, and there are a few things that might come to pass. But it's a bit, it's nothing I can really go get into now because, you know, it's, it's a bit, you know, before it's, everything is clear, done and, and signed and, and completely, you know, 100% confirmed, we, I really shouldn't be, you know, discussing it openly because, you know, that, that once we know for sure it's happening, we'll be, you know, we'll definitely tell everyone. <laughs> so, so what I'm hearing is there's more to come. <laughs> there could be, there could be. <laughs> there could be, there could okay. Be. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it seems that uh, I wonder has it made it easier that uh, role playing has made a real resurgence in like oh, the yeah. last decade or so that some of these companies are now seeing it as you know there's always been like the movies, books, comic books. You know, this is a whole other way for them to get their i you know their IP their 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 product out to people. So. I definitely think that's right. Uh, we have seen. I think there is a, a much. Uh, more attention now on tabletop RPGs than than just five years ago. I think it's it's now uh, coming to be seen as something to be taken, you know, seriously. That this has real and it's such a good way to 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 because tabletop role players are so passionate and committed. And it's even <laughs> though we're not the biggest, I mean, it's not the biggest media out there. We're I think you know. A, we're champions. We're true believers. We're truly passionate about this stuff. And I think having a, a, an RPG, that's a way to get everybody together around the franchise, really hardcore fans. I think you can find here. And I think that, that, that also has, you know, it's, it's probably, I would assume a good thing for the uh, license owners as well to have this kind of passionate people championing and the franchises uh, that they love. So I think, yeah, definitely it's been a bigger interest uh, now in the recent, uh, recent years. But yeah. So we're in a lot of the, 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 the forums that you know, talk about these games and you've seen it in the, in like the, some of the alien forums and I'm sure you're going to see it in the Blade Runner forums that, uh, that people are like, have never played a TTRPG before, but just love Love Alien, uh, or, or and they say, "Hey, how do I get started playing this game?" And, and the communities um, that you know, I've 
been a part of have been really welcoming and and super great with these these uh, uh to try and bring these new players uh, up to speed uh so yeah i i really like that about the the whole ttrpg uh community as a whole there i mean of course there's you know bad actors everywhere but but uh you know in general it's been very very nice for for welcoming new new uh ip so uh matt did you have any other questions about blade runners uh, no, I'm sorry that threw me off. No, I didn't. I, I, that's, that's pretty much what I've got. I mean, that's uh, yeah. No, I'm I'm really excited to see it. I, like I said, I was looking at the spread on the Kickstarter. It looks again. That, another thing aspect I've noticed is like um, really bringing a lot of style and and just like that that whole uh, kit looks amazing. Yeah. Right. It, it's like the 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 time and effort and the art and everything goes in there. It makes a really beautiful presentation. I know I've got the the box set for the twilight 2000 it's awesome like it's just a great product to open up and like pull all the pieces out and, and take a look at stuff so um i think that kind of attention to sort of art and design and quality has really been it's been a good uh, uh thing for me at least in the products so i i don't know if there's a question there no, <laughs> just a, no, so much more questions so. yeah no thank you and it's definitely I think for us, even from the very early start, it's been something that we've been, you know, one of the four founders, he's a graphic designer by, by trade. Uh, mm. So I think that was important early on because then that meant that we actually had someone who, who knew uh, their way around, the, you know, design, graphic design and stuff like that starting out. And it's been an important part, I think, all the way through, because even though the game design is, of course, the most important thing, I think for uh, RPD to really work, at least for me, fully or on all levels you need to have the writing needs to be there the mechanics need to be there the art the graphic design and all has to kind of tie come together for a, a game to really really work on all levels because graphic design and illustration is so important to create that immersion immersion and that you need so i think it's it's core and, and key to get you know a game to really work so that's i mean that's been something we've always focused quite a bit on so so uh, I'm happy to hear that you know you you like it. Yeah, yeah, it translates well. And we talked about this with the um, when we uh, interviewed some of the uh, folks from the Stockholm Cartel, and and all of those books are, are beautifully designed too, in such different styles. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I definitely like that aspect. And, and there's obviously you know when you're when you're a, a pretty obsessive gamer, you've got a lot of books that you you probably own more books than than games you'll ever uh, ever play, uh, but you still like to pull them off the shelf and, and take a look at them. So it's uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's been good. But uh, so I, I think uh, my last kind of. Mm, do, do you have any? Uh, so how? I'm sorry, I'm gonna edit this all out. But <laughs> <laughs> so so as far as uh, where you're at uh, with uh, the Blade Runner uh, Kickstarter, it's about wrapping up. I'm hoping to edit this and get it out quickly. But what are some of the stretch goals that you still have left to uh, achieve? Right. Yeah. One of the things uh, we have uh, left on 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 the list uh, right now at the uh, when we're recording this, we're getting close to one, which is uh, a case file map pack, uh, and that's uh, again when we that we discussed earlier that we want to support and 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 uh, uh, help game masters design their own case files and having this is a map pack, a digital map pack that would basically be a bunch of maps for variety of locations that you can use to create your own case file. I think that would be immensely useful when you do that because it's you can just pull out some something that would work for the scenario that you're mm. designing. So that's that's one thing. Uh, after that, there is the Roll20 modules. We already have unlocked uh, virtual tabletop modules for the Foundry platform, uh, which is quite popular, and we have a bunch of our games there. But we also... Uh, want to support we also have games on the roll 20 platform mm -hmm. so if we reach this one all the backers will also get uh, without any uh, additional cost these uh, fully full content modules for both the the core rulebook and the starter set on roll 20 as well that's so awesome cool nice yeah. yeah 
And finally, yeah. the last one we have lined up is a, a, like a PDF digital compilation of, of assets and informants, like characters you can also use in your own case files that kind of will provide information and, and, and clues to the Blade Runners. And, and they can also be easily introduced into your own case files. So that's also something we have coming up if we get that uh, get that far but it's uh, yeah it's going to be uh, an interesting last two days now that campaign and see how far we can get so how's your mood uh, when you're you you've done a lot of uh, successful kickstars so how's your mood get as you're uh, reaching that that finish line do you is it is it anxious yeah. or excited or <laughs> no it's uh it's always uh you might think that after i think this is like we've done almost like 30 kickstarters by now in the last since we did the first one it's about seven years ago yeah but it's always nerve-wracking really and it's 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 and fun and crazy and it's busy and it's intense you know there's uh, you know there's a lot of questions and a lot of comments and and feedback, which is you know so we want to be there and in on the on the comments page and, and reply to everything and, and be part of the conversation because that's kind of the point of a Kickstarter is to get that community feedback and 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 the communication going. So that's it's uh, it's a lot of fun and then you never quite know. Even though we were quite confident that this one would do well, you never know what that actually means. And there are so many unknown factors going into this that it's always it's always like you know timing from the deep end. It's it's uh, never, it's never. You're never you know too relaxed when you run a Kickstarter. So it's, uh, and now just to <laughs> yeah. see how will we actually what will the finish be like? You know you need quite you, you don't know. It's uh yeah it's it's, uh, it's interesting and and you know it, it's uh, a bit nerve wracking but fun. Uh, and uh, last question, I guess, is is delivery. Uh, when is uh, when is Blade Runner expected to deliver? Yeah, we. Uh, Plan to hope to be able to share full PDFs with backers uh, in a number of weeks uh, after the Kickstarter ends. So fairly mm-hmm. soon. Uh, that There are a few things that we need to get done before we can do that. But pretty much we're in good shape. Then there's the matter of, of printing and, and shipping. And these days with, there is a bit of a paper shortage all over the world. And shipping mm-hmm. is a bit of a mess. So that means things that took one month before now take two or three months just to get paper or something like that. So that mm-hmm. means... It's a bit more uncertain, but the, we plan for and we have good hope to be able to ship uh, out to backers before the end of the year and have a, also a general release even in stores before before the holidays. Oh, so that's okay. the plan. That's what we aim for and work for. Uh, hopefully we'll get there. Yeah. Hmm. Thank goodness for PDF. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a lot easier to send. I don't know what we would do with that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, we, we finished our whole... Twilight 2000 actual play before the actual product shipped. So that was all right, done. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alpha. Um, and then, and yeah. Then the yeah. yeah. Um, it, was, it was super, a lot of fun, but uh, is there anything else? Uh, I don't have any other questions, Matt. Do you have any other questions? No, no, that's about it. Uh, Thomas, uh, do you have any uh, uh, final comments? Or no, words? I don't think so. I'm good. I'm happy. I don't think I have anything else. Well, I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, sure. this past la- the last few days uh, to come on this. This has been special. So, yeah, uh, thanks a lot, and thanks for. I mean, uh, you know, we've we've really enjoyed the games uh, as a group, and we look forward to like like Nathan said, we've we've got more than we'll ever be able to play. We just keep <laughs> buying them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, much appreciated your time talking to us Thank today. You. It's really uh, it's 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 interesting. Great, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. And so, uh, listeners, uh, yeah, I hope to have this edited out soon. So, uh, if you haven't checked out the Kickstarter, check it out. And they've got a lot of other uh, great games too. You could you could check out. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, 